Hello, everybody. My name is Darren Guidry. I'm chairman of the Terrebonne Parish Council, and I'm, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Uh, our parish president couldn't make it. He's in Washington, D.C. with several parish presidents from across our area trying to get more money from D.C. and the Gulf uh, royalties, the Go Mesa funds that uh, the, all the oil field companies uh, are giving to the locals to help rebuild our area because of all of the impacts that the industry and such have. And so uh, th uh, hopefully they're very successful and I'm rooting for them. And, uh, and so uh, I am here today to welcome you. Again, thank you all for coming. This is the third in our series of celebrating the bicentennial of Terrebonne Parish. And today uh, we celebrate uh, our military and our law enforcement. Of course, yesterday we celebrated the anniversary of D-Day. So um, it's, it's in that shadow that we uh, here look at our military and look at our law enforcement uh, history in Terrebonne Parish. Before we do that, I'd like to uh, introduce um, a few elected officials and dignitaries we have here. Uh, we have um, um, Mr. Councilman Danny Babin is here. Uh, welcome, uh, Danny. Um, we have uh, Councilman Dirk Guidry here. We have a uh, former parish president, Michelle Claude, who's here. Uh, we have uh, Chief Crapel with the Homa Indians uh, here. Also, Christian Bergeron is representing Mr. Garrett, uh, Congressman Garrett Graves. He's here, Christian. Uh, and we uh, have our sheriff, Mr. Uh, uh, sheriff Tim Saunier, uh, who's here. Uh, our Homa Police Chief, uh, Dana Coleman. Uh, Assistant uh, Chief Dwayne Farmer. Uh, Captain Lonnie Lusco. Captain. Lieutenant Philip Crabtree. And of course, Mr. Gary Phillips is here and part of our program today. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to take just a, a moment of silence uh, to remember the, the victims of the, the horrible shooting in Uvalde, Texas and all the life that was lost uh, in that uh, horrible tragedy. If you don't mind, just a moment of silence. Thank you. And moving along, I'd like to call on uh, Chief Crapel with the Homa Indians to uh, have a special prayer of music in honor of the military and our law enforcement. Uh, Chief? Ahilito, homasia, yupiche, miko omas, okata and sihili. It feels amazing to be the first chief in 100 years to speak our original language. You know, uh, when I came in four years ago, I got a group of people to go back. We must go again speaking people. It's a southern dialect with the southern tribes and things. You know, the Homer Indians been here in, in, in Terrebonne Parish for hundreds of years, you know. And uh, we spread in six different parishes. We over 19,000 people. And I was just up in, uh, in Washington a few months ago talking to Congress about pushing to get us federally recognized because it's very important because we have thousands of people here and that would bring millions of dollars into Terrebonne Parish, you know, and looking forward to working together, you know, so we can, you know, better Terrebonne Parish. The first song I'm going to do, it's a, it's a veteran song because Native people, when we have our powwow and stuff, we always honor our veterans, you know, and this song was written in 1959 by the Punka tribe of Oklahoma and it was to bring the veterans back safe from war.
And this next song I'm going to do is a press song you know, for all our military and law enforcement. And, you know, but before we're going to do the song, I'm also a, a minister. So if you bow your heads, we pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord Jesus. We ask you to guide us and lead us, Lord, to serve you and serve our people at Terraborn Parish. We ask you to help us make the right decisions for all our people, Lord. We ask you to come together in strength, Lord. And move us forward. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Excellent. Now I'd like to call on our public safety director, Mr. Steve Pondville. Could you please lead us in a pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, here we're here to uh, look back at our law enforcement and our military uh, throughout the years, throughout our bicentennial, uh, and of course uh, today. And we have several of them here. We have uh, several historic uh, things for you to see. But right now, I'd like to turn it over to uh, the expert in military, uh, Mr. Uh, Gary Phillips, to take over the program and let's celebrate the bicentennial. Before we begin, I would like all veterans to please stand. No, 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 Mimi doesn't listen. We are here tonight to honor our local heroes, men and women like yourself who answered the nation's call for need. You are to be forever honored and respected, loved and honored and truly cherished. A grateful nation thanks you for your service to this great nation. Thank you so much. Since the earliest days of the founding of this nation, common soldiers have rallied to its defense in times of peril. When our freedoms were threatened, citizen soldiers have stepped forth, risking their fortunes, their lives, in defense of this nation. Unlike the nations of Europe, our country does not have a tradition of a large standing professional army. Our country has instead relied on the faithfulness and devotion of its citizenry to defend this nation's security. This premise was codified in the Second Amendment to the Constitution, which states, and I quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The purpose of my presentation tonight is to trace the military service of the citizens of this parish and to highlight their efforts of heroic individuals who have brought honor to themselves and our nation through their sacrifices. Our nation's struggle for independence began in 1775 with the opening shots of the American Revolution at Lexington and Concord. Though thousands of miles away from the bayous of South Louisiana, these shots would have an impact on local inhabitants. Spain had acquired Louisiana, French Louisiana in 1762 in the Treaty of Fontainebleau at the end of the French and Indian War preventing the British from acquiring the Louisiana Territory. The British did acquire Florida 
and the area north of Lake Pontchartrain extending across the Mobile in Pensacola, then known as West Florida. The relationship between the French colonials and the new Spanish government was at best tenuous. An open rebellion was crushed with six, six principal leaders publicly executed in 1772. The relationship changed dramatically when in 1776, 30-year-old Don Bernardo de Galvez was appointed a colonel in the regiment of Louisiana and second in command of provincial forces. In 1777, he married Felicite de Maxine Destrahan, the daughter of a wealthy French landowner, and this greatly helped to improve the Franco-Spanish alliance in our province. In 1779, Spain announced it was declaring war on Great Britain as an ally of the fledgling United States of America. Upon receiving the news, Galvez summoned all locals to a public meeting at the Cabildo in New Orleans and announced he would only defend the province with the help of all inhabitants. There was a cry of unity among those gathered. Volunteers would gather from throughout the province to form a fighting force. I very much wanted to find evidence that residents of our area were part of Galvez's troops that would move on the British. And through the invaluable assistance of local historian and genealogist, Ms. Connie Gaines, I had my proof. One of her earliest ancestors, Joseph Ditt Ro Ro Roger, or Roger, was a fusilier, an infantryman who fought with small arms in the volunteers in the company of the militia of La Fouche de Chittimaches. I believe it is truly remarkable that men with names such as Roger, Leblanc, Dugas, Bajeron, and Babin, Frenchmen, would fight for American freedom under the Spanish flag. But fight they did under Galvez's daring leadership. The forces took control of British garrisons at, at uh, Baton Rouge, Bayamanchek, Mobile, and Pensacola. These victories were instrumental in assisting the Americans in their quest for freedom. Victories won by contributions of local citizen soldiers. A footnote to the story, there are members of the Daughters of the American Revolution and Sons of the American Revolution in our area who qualify for membership because their ancestors were members of the Galvez expedition. The next chapter of our story is 20 years after the American Revolution, 1803. Napoleon Bonaparte forces Spain to cede to him Louisiana in the Treaty of San Ildefonso, taking effect on November the 30th, 1803. Only three weeks later, the, ter ter the territory was ceded to the United States in the Louisiana Purchase. The Louisiana Territory was admitted to the Union in 1812 as a state of Louisiana composed of 18 civil parishes. Terrebonne was still considered at that time part of Lafouche. Local genealogical ex uh, research has revealed that at least two local citizens participated in the Battle of New Orleans on January the 8th, 1815. Manuel Dominguez, a descendant of local genealogist, Patty Whitney, served at the Battle of New Orleans as part of the Baratarians under the colorful Jean Lafitte. Andre Toops of Terrebonne served at the Battle of New Orleans under the leadership of Captain Roman. His wife, Angelique, applied for a widow's pension in 1876 and was granted her benefit. The application, shown here. <laughs> okay, sorry about that glitch in the technology. Okay. Historians agree that the contributions of the Baratarians and local militia were critical in Jackson's historic victory over the British on the plains at Chalmette. The peace and tranquility of the Bayou region was ripped asunder on April the 12th, 1861, when the Confederate cannons opened fire on Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina Harbor. The Civil War begins. The effects of the war truly came to the forefront with the fall of New Orleans to federal forces on April the 12th, uh, pardon me, April 18th, 1862. A mortar flotilla bombarded Forts Jackson and St. Philip below New Orleans, and on April 24th, the forts were bypassed, and on April 25th, the city of New Orleans fell without a fight. On May 1st, the city was occupied by federal troops led by General Benjamin Butler of Massachusetts. The sudden fall of New Orleans and the subsequent loss of control of the Mississippi River up to Baton Rouge meant the Lafouche District, which encompassed Terrebonne Parish, was now at the mercy of federal guns. The principal bayous in Terrebonne, in the Terrebonne region, were by a Terrebonne, Black, Blue, Du Large, Chacahula, Petit Caillou, and Grand Caillou. These waterways would be crucial in the efforts of local guerrilla fighters to resist the federal troops as they tried to subjugate the area. The banks of the principal streams were so heavily settled they resembled contiguous villages. Terrebonne had the highest proportion of slaves in the Lafouche district. 
56.1% of the total population. Home of the Perry Seed at that time had a population of approximately 600. Thibodeau or Thibodeauville, approximately 1,400. With the, fall, with the abrupt fall of New Orleans, federal troops began coming into the Lafourche District by railroad, eventually establishing their headquarters in Thibodeau. The most significant incident in Terrebonne Parish is about to occur, the Homa Incident. May 9, 1862, the Confederate blockade runner, Fox, arrived in Bayou Grancaya, laden with 350,000 pounds of gunpowder, 4,500 rifles, medicine, and other supplies. Informants in the area notified their federal forces and an detachment of 65 men under the command of Colonel James McMillan of the 21st Indiana Volunteers were sent from Algiers by railroad, de detrained at Terrebonne Station, now known as Shriver, and marched the 13 miles through the village of Homa on their way south. Local militia, numbering between 15 and 20, decided to put up a resistance. They learned that two wagons were headed northward toward Homa up Grand Kaya accompanied by Negroes on horseback, each wagon containing two soldiers who were ill on the way back to the railroad station. The locals decided to ambush the wagons a mile and a half below Homa. At sundown, shotgun buckshot blasts ripped the two wagons. Two soldiers were killed instantly, and the other two were slightly wounded. A private Miller was able to escape the ambush and his pursuers, and he eventually reached Terrebonne Station. The wagons contained the bodies of the two dead soldiers and the, two, and the wounded soldier, Private Josephus Morris were driven to Homa. Morris was placed in the local jail. It would be reported that the two dead soldiers were completely stripped, their bodies brutally abused, kicked, and beaten. The main perpetrator was a local by the name of Doc Jennings. The bodies of the two men were buried with a single blanket thrown over them in a shallow grave directly in front of the courthouse, prominently displayed for all to see. When word of the incident reached General Butler's headquarters in New Orleans, he ordered Lieutenant Colonel John Keith of the 21st Indiana with 240 men and two artillery pieces to move out on Homa. They were transported by rail to Terrebonne Station with orders, and I quote, to execute the guilty and confiscate and destroy all property of those implicated. On May 12th, these forces entered a deserted Homa. Three-fourths of the population had fled. Local citizens, citizens who remained were forced to exhume the two bodies of the dead soldier for a proper burial. This was held at St. Francis de Sales Catholic Church with full military honors. Due to the lack of cooperation from the local citizens, Colonel Keith issued a proclamation saying that if he was not given the names of the offenders in 48 hours, he would burn the entire town of Homa to the ground and do the same to surrounding plantations. The locals soon came forward with a list of the guilty parties. Many of them had already fled the area and were in hiding, or were in, hiding in local swamps. The properties of six of the ringleaders were seized and or burned. Colonel Keith, in his report, also reported that he told the local citizen that the national United States flag would fly permanently over the courthouse, and if it was removed, he would return, and the entire town would be burned to the ground. He also th said that there would be terrible consequences if the graves of the two soldiers were in any way desecrated. Twelve citizens were arrested and were taken to Algiers to hand it, be handed over for punishment. The message to the local citizens was clear. Any resistance would be mercilessly crushed. Much of the fighting throughout the remainder of the war would consist of unconventional warfare, guerrilla bands of 20 or less. They conducted hit-and-run uh, raids on Union-owned plantations, stealing horses and mules. They also bushwhacked local small Union columns moving between towns. The swamp guerrillas benefited from the element of surprise and familiarity with a network of waterways and back roads. I've often think about looking at this map. Imagine Homo without the intercoastal canal. Imagine virgin untouched cypress forests all around us, untouched hardwood forests, and the major waterways were the main, main way to get around, and the locals knew it like the back of their hand. And what roads they were, they knew those uh, explicitly. So uh, guerrilla, guerrilla combat through 1860 to 1865. Operating from horseback, pirogues, and flatboats, they constantly harassed the, the occupying forces. This type of warfare only ended with the cessation of hostilities in April of 1865. The world was rocked by the sounds of war in August of 1914, with the major nations of Europe erupting in open warfare. The next three years would see millions of men killed, maimed, uh, damaged forever by the effects of modern war waged in the air, on land, and the oceans of the world with deadly advanced weaponry. The citizens of this nation watched with great sympathy for the suffering in Europe, but the general mood was one of isolation. 
It was not our war to fight. This mood would change in 1917 with the increased aggression of Imperial Germany, especially the undersea war waged by its advanced submarine fleet, the infamous U-boats. There were indiscriminately sinking ships, including American. War was declared by Congress April 6, 1917. The citizens of Louisiana would provide 80,000 troops for the First World War. Of that number, 10 soldiers from Terrebonne Parish would pay the ultimate sacrifice in the war, the majority falling to deadly diseases, most probably the deadly flu pandemic of 1918-1919. The second doughboy to fall was Lennox Hotard, a 24-year-old from Berg who died in the Allied offensive in the Meuse-Argonne area of northern France in the late fall of 1918. In 1919, the local American Legion post was named in Private Hotard's honor. The first officers of Post 31 were World War I veterans Emile Lepere, commander, John P. Traha, vice commander, Francis Berg, adjutant, William Gale Davidson, finance officer, Irwin F. Palmer, historian, Edwin A. Sabwa, chaplain, and Dewey Daspit, sergeant at arms. September 1st, 1939. Adolf Hitler's blitzkrieg invades helpless Poland and World War II begins. By 1940, Hitler's forces seemed invincible as France had fallen. England stands alone to face the Nazi onslaught. In the summer of 1940, President Franklin Roosevelt is urged by General George C. Marshall to activate the National Guard units across our country to supplement our undersized federal army. The legislation making this possible had already been passed in 1933 as part of the National Defense Act. The vote in Congress passed by one vote. General Marshall's passionate plea before Congress was the deciding factor. The first National Guard units were ordered into active service beginning in August of 1940, and by the fall of that year, 300,000 guardsmen were brought into active duty, doubling the size of the active army. The time of service was to be one year. The National Guard unit in Homa was activated on December the 6th, 1940, and the members were to return on December 7th, 1941. History would decide otherwise. There was a parade down the main street of Homa to honor these hometown heroes as they marched to the local bus station to board awaiting buses to take them to training facilities. The National Guard in Homa was the 3rd Battalion, Charlie, of the 156th Infantry Division led by Captain Christian Buster Olivier. The first stop for the Homan unit was Camp Blanding, near Stark, Florida. When the men arrived on the 30,000-acre base, much of it was swampland. The men were tasked with constructing housing and making the area livable. The men were forbidden to speak French on the base. As one officer said, we are the American Army. We speak English here. In a meeting, an officer saw two men whispering in the back, and he yelled, what's the matter? Don't you understand English? A young Louisiana recruit answered, no, sir, he doesn't. I am translating your words into French, so he can the forbidden French language, once a liability, would become an invaluable asset when the troops moved into French-speaking North Africa and into France itself. These men would find themselves much sought after as interpreters for their French allies. The 156th Division arrived in England on October the 6th, 1942, the and the 2nd Battalion was sent to Oran, Algeria for military police duties due to their French linguistic abilities. The remainder of the division trained in England for the Normandy invasion and the headquarters detachment and Colonel L, pardon me, Company L, assaulted the beaches on June 6, 1944. The remainder of the division was in France by June 24, 1944. The troops were assigned to guard the flanks of the Allied advance and the Red Ball Express Highway. The division would later provide security for the Supreme Allied Headquarters Expeditionary Force from October 15, 1944, over to the duration. The division returned to the United States in March of 1946, having brought honor to themselves and their colors. Thousands more of Terrebonne's male citizens were about to enter active duty. The Selective Service Act of 1940 required all men ages 21 to 36 to register for possible military induction by October 16, 1940. Registration sites were set up all over the parish, manned by approximately 250 volunteers who assisted the men in filling out the forms. The, fr on Friday, the Friday, October 18th edition of the Home, Home, Home Daily Courier listed 4,878 men who had registered as required. Each man was assigned a number. Clifton Ross was number one, and Leo Kappel was 4,599, the last one assigned. 
The next step in the process occurred on October the 29th, 1940, when Secretary of War Henry Stimson pulled the numbers for the sequence selection from the famous Goldfish Bowl. The first number pulled was 158. This corresponded to Albert McKinley Dangerfield, a 33-year-old black man. All the names of the men and their respective numbers were published in the local newspaper. The day-to-day -day operation of the draft board was coordinated by an 18-year-old girl, Mrs. Louise Hotard, Miss Louise Hotard. The office was located in the courthouse in two small offices that had been allocated to Sen Senator Allen Ellender. Miss Hotard now began filling and mailing out the draft questionnaires to the men whose numbers had been selected. The completed questionnaires were returned to the draft board office. The draft board itself consisted of seven men. Tom Holcomb, chairman, L. H. Bolin, secretary, Dr. Saul Landry, Dr. T. I. St. Martin, Alex Conley, Dr. H. L. Haydell, and Vic Morin. The meetings were held at night where every questionnaire was read and the group would determine the man's status. Those deemed qualified for consideration were now sent to local doctors for physical examinations, and if they passed, they were classified 1A, suitable for induction. The parish's first quarter quota, seven white men, was filled by volunteers, and they left by bus for Camp Beauregard on December the 5th, 1940. They were given a send-off, which included speeches by Sheriff Peter Bourgeois, Rotary Club President Raul Toops, and a National Guard color guard. The pace of the draft board picked up immeasurably after December 7, 1941. As the war progressed, the need for men increased dramatically. There were three separate calls for registration in 1942 alone. In February, ages 20, and then 36 to 45. In April, 45 to 65. Miss Hotard's father, who was 65, was one of the ones who registered. June, uh, in June, 18 to 20 year olds. The monthly quota for the parish was determined by the headquarters in Jackson Barracks in New Orleans. There was a quarter for white and black draftees. There weren't enough volunteers. The names on the rolls were used for induction. Ms. Hotar became the chief clerk for the draft board on, in August of 1942, now in charge of a staff numbering four people. She was 21 years old, the youngest chief clerk in the state of Louisiana. Not everyone welcomed a chance to serve in the military. Several men failed to report for induction, and the FBI was notified. Four men were arrested from our parish, tried in New Orleans in federal court, and sentenced from anywhere to three to four years at hard labor in a federal prison. Ms. Hotard had to travel by bus to New Orleans to testify at their trials to show that they had been duly notified. By the end of the war, Ms. Hotard and her staff processed 11,250 men who qualified to serve this nation during this time of need. December 7, 1941, a date that will live in infamy. In two hours that changed the world, on a sleepy Sunday morning, the United States of America was suddenly and violently thrust into a world war that the nation had tried to avoid. The Japanese government, military forces, and civilian population would pay dearly for this unprovoked, vicious attack on Pearl Harbor. On December the 11th, 1941, Hitler made ultimately one of his greatest mistakes when his Nazi government declared war on the United States. The German Navy, the Kriegsmarine, provided proved initially to be much better prepared for the war than our own United States Navy. The German command knew that the lifeblood of the Allied military was the oil produced in the oil fields of Louisiana, Texas, and Oklahoma. This oil was refined in some of the world's largest refineries in Baton Rouge, Freeport, Texas, and Houston, Texas. There turned into aviation fuel, diesel fuel, and gasoline so desperately needed to combat the Axis forces. In February of 1942, the Germans began Operation Drumbeat, the coordinated attacks by the German submarines, U-boats on Allied shipping in the Gulf of Mexico. The primary target was fuel tankers. German Admiral Karl Dönitz, leader of the Kriegsmarine, told his U-boat captains as they embarked, and I quote, attack only ships over 10,000 tons and give first priority to tankers. Don't bring back any torpedoes. Good hunting. The hunting was indeed very good. There were no naval escorts and no coastal blackouts. The German subs remained submerged during the daylight hours, then surfaced and hunted their prey at night. Ships appeared as silhouettes against the lights of coastal communities. In the month of May 1942 alone, 41 ships were sunk in the Gulf of Mexico, a number of them right off our coastline. The first U-boat to enter the Gulf of Mexico was U-507 under the command of Haro Shat. This boat unfortunately enjoyed great success, sinking 10 ships in a very, very short period of time. 
badly wounded merchant seamen were brought up Bayou Terrebonne to the Ellender Clinic for treatment for their injuries, often including severe burns. The survivors were rescued by local fishermen and shrimpers. Eventually, 58 ships were sunk, 19 damaged by these attacks by U-boats. The German submariners refer to these days as the happy times. Despite increased protection for the merchant ships provided by our Navy, only one U-boat was sunk by our, by our forces, U-166, which was sunk near the mouth of the Mississippi River on July 30, 1942, by Patrol Craft 566. The Texaco Oil and Refining Company had a huge presence in Terrible and Parish with their oil fields at Cayu Island and Lake Pelto. The Texaco offshore barges with a capacity of 16,000 barrels of crude oil were bound for the refineries at Port Arthur, Texas. These barges made ideal targets for German torpedoes. In 1942 alone, Texaco lost five of its best tankers along with 97 of its most experienced officers and men. In response to the German U-boat menace in the Gulf of Mexico in early 1942, uh, which resulted in the sinking eventually of 87 vessels totaling 500,000 tons by May of 42, the United States Congress authorized the construction of airship facilities at Glencoe, Georgia, Hitchcock, Texas, south of Houston, and Houma, Louisiana. Due to wartime steel restrictions, the facilities were built using timber construction. Airships were considered the ideal answer for anti-submarine warfare because they could stay on target, on station for hours, patrolling the shipping lanes. These uh, airships were armed with death charges and machine guns. They carried a crew of 10. The wood for the hangar, which you can see in the background, was redwood from Oregon and was transported to Homa via railways. The general contractor for the project was H. Horace Williams of New Orleans. Local carpenters were hired to do the construction. One of the local carpenter's helpers was Odie Hebert, Odie Hebert, the late Odie Hebert. In an interview, he told me the hangar was like a large erector set. The eventual problem was that the redwood had been soaked in salt water as a preservative. This caused severe corrosion problems with the bolts used to assemble the hangar. He told me they needed constant, constant maintenance. The first truss, uh, truss was raised on February 20, 1943. The overall dimensions of the hangar were length 1,254 feet long, width 296.5 feet wide, and height 160 feet. The Homa facility was the largest wooden hangar constructed during World War II, mainly because of the kind of uh, cone-shaped opening and closing areas. The first of the K-type airships arrived in Homa May 13, 1943. Ironically, by the time the airships became operational, the German U-boats had shifted their attention to other areas. The airships never encountered a U-boat during the duration of their operations. In 19, April 1944 was a disastrous month for Homa airships. On April 19th, K-133 was forced down in the Gulf of Mexico during a violent thunderstorm, and nine crewmen were killed. Only one sailor was rescued. On April 2nd, a windstorm with gusts of 70 knots blew open the doors of the hangar, and the airships broke loose from their moorings. Airships K-57 and K-2 were totally destroyed, and the third K-56 had to be returned to Akron, Ohio, to the Goodyear Rubber Company to be rebuilt. Kind of a footnote to this story, I interviewed Bill Copeland, a local gentleman who worked for Texaco, and he told me he joined the Navy to see the world. They put him on a train, he wound up in Shreve, Louisiana, he said, what am I doing in Shreve? <laughs> and he ended up working on the engines out here at the air base. He married a local girl. Many of you probably may remember Jim Crowley, who ran the Homa uh, bowling alley for years. He, too, was another one who came down here to work. The air base proved to be, of course, uh, a non-issue because the, the subs had left. The air base was deactivated September the 12th, 1944. The $15 million air station was leased to the city of Homa in Terrebonne Parish for $1 a year. This parish produced many outstanding military personnel during World War II. I'd like to highlight the efforts of several. Euless Fungi, on the left. In June of 1942, a major in, a Japanese invasion force was approaching the Pacific Atoll, Midway Island, 1,000 miles from the Hawaiian Islands. On this island was a contingent of United States Marines, including a young corporal from Homa, Euless Fungi, later a sergeant, who was working on the flight line. On the afternoon of June 3rd, 
The 18-year-old corporal was working, and a Navy fighter plane landed, and the pilot disembarked. In the darkness, he shouted, Frenchie, where are you from, boy? Corporal Fungi replied, I'm from Homa, Louisiana, sir. The voice said, come over here. I'm from Homa. The pilot was Lieutenant James Mormon by DeLarge. The two men did not know each other, but had common relationships. The next day, Lieutenant Mormon went off on his last mission. He never returned, presumed lost in combat. Corporal Fungi would man a 50 caliber machine gun during the subsequent air attacks by the Japanese on Midway. His service career would see him stationed all over the Pacific, including tours on Guadalcanal, the Spiritu Santo, the Russell and Fiji Islands. He attained, the, he attained the rank of Staff Sergeant in the process. Mr. Fungi tragically lost his older brother, Renal, and navigator on a B-29 on a mission over Japan in 1945. Augustus Brown. One of the most storied groups in World War II were the, were the Tuskegee Airmen, black pilots who overcame prejudice and discrimination to bring honor to themselves and to this nation in their role as protectors of bomber missions over occupied Europe. Homo native Augustus Brown was a vital member of this famous air group, the 99th Fighter Squadron, known as the Red Tails, because of the crimson paint on the tails of their P-51 fighter planes. It is said that this group did not lose a single bomber that it protected to enemy fighter planes. Mr. Brown left college his senior year to join this historic group. Throughout his life, he remained reticent about his war exploits, choosing to focus on the now rather than the past. Specific facts about his number of missions any number of planes that he might have shot down remain unknown. We do know that he continued, continued to show a love of aviation throughout the remainder of his life and concluded among his friends, local aviation enthu enthusiasts, Charlie Hammonds and Mr. C.J. Christ. Mr. Brown was posthumously awarded the Congressional Gold Medal on March 29, 2007 by President George W. Bush. The President said on this occasion, quote, Yours is a story of the human spirit. And it ends like all great stories do, with wisdom and lessons and hope for tomorrow. Mr. Brown had a distinguished career in our local school system as an assistant principal, principal, and supervisor, and he passed away in 1999 at the age of 78. Mr. Ray Marcellum. The skies over Europe were filled with many dangers for the men of the 8th Air Force, exploding anti-aircraft shells, machine gun bullets, and rockets from German fighter planes. For Sergeant Ray Marcella, his 15th mission on July 17, 1944, was to be his last. Sergeant Marcella, Sergeant Marcella was a waste gunner on a B-17, a member of the 390th Bombardier Group that was hit by German anti-aircraft fire. He was forced to bail out over a German air base and was immediately captured. Over the next 277 days, he was subjected to solitary confinement, intense questioning, and a very meager, almost starvation diet. He was in Stadog Luft 4, a prison camp that held approximately 10,000 captured Allied airmen in what is today present-day Poland. The biggest challenge, according to Mr. Marcella, was a shortage of food. He went from around 140 pounds when captured to 89 when he was released. As the Russian army neared the camp in late 1944, the prisoners were forced to march in the dead of winter over 500 miles to another prison camp in northern Germany. Many airmen died along the way due to exposure and malnutrition. Mr. Marcella, thankfully, was liberated by British troops led by Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery on April 16, 1945. He said of the experience, I feel my Catholic faith sustained me through all of this. Two Homa families need to be acknowledged because of their contributions to the war effort. Mr. and Mrs. Edgar Schecksnyder had five sons in the service during World War II. Edgar, Clifton, Norris, Irvin, and Harold. And Irvin, of course, would one day be our police chief in Homa. Mr. and Mrs. Francis Parr had six children in the war effort, three sons, Ralph, Ernest, Jimmy, and three girls, Francis Marie, Joyce, and Betty. And I am proud to say that we are honored tonight to have with us two of the six, Mr. Jimmy Parr and Ms. Francis Marie. Would you please welcome them? <laughs> Such devotion. I think um, Jimmy's sister is lovingly known as uh, Mimi and also Sarge, still today. She still outranks all of them. <laughs> Thank you for your service. I'm also proud to say my dad is here tonight, Jim Phillips. Uh, joined the Navy at 17, served in the Pacific in World War II, was called back up in Korea, and he is a robust 95. If you're a single woman, see him afterwards. Okay. After the, after, the, after the conclusion of the war, the Terrebonne Garden Club decided to dedicate trees in Jim Bowie Park 
for the 90 Terrebonne citizens who died, who died in the war. The project never saw completion. Last year, under the leadership of Ms. Linda Brazier, the memorial was finally uh, dedicated, and here it is. And looking back over the World War II period, a number of names come to the forefront that certainly could have been included and should have been included. Two Davidson brothers, Charles and Percival, both pilots, lieutenants in the Army Air Corps. Percival lost during the war in combat. Charles himself survived a harrowing experience being forced down into the jungles of New Guinea and uh, finding his way back to freedom and civilization. Lieutenant Lloyd Geist from our area, wonderful pilot, flew P-47s in Europe flying top cover during the Normandy invasion. Uh, Corporal Irvin Kelly of the United States Marine Corps, who fought on Guadalcanal and suffered a horrific injury. He had to fight on despite those injuries for the next four months until he was finally relieved. Yesterday, we celebrated the 78th anniversary of the invasion of Normandy. Among those going ashore that day was Sidney Arsenault, a 23-year-old infantryman from our area, and somehow he survived that horror on Omaha, Omaha Beach. And we're honored to have his son, Bobby, here with us tonight. Bobby, thank you for your, your dad's service right here. Bobby, thank you. <laughs> Countless other stories of heroes from this area. The post-war peace our nation had enjoyed for five years was shattered on June 25, 1950, when military forces of the communist North Korean government suddenly and viciously invaded the democratic South Korea with devastating results. The United States government, headed by President Harry Truman, decided that the unprovoked uh, attack had to be answered with a military response from the free nations of the world. With the backing of the United Nations, military forces of our country entered the combat to secure and ensure the freedom of the South Korean people. Among the troops sent to Korea was an 18-year-old Marine from Homa, Charles Francis Bajeron. Charles, Francis, Charles Bajeron dreamed of being a Marine while growing up in downtown Homa, right near St. Francis. When his older brother, Leo, returned from the Navy in 1946, he shared his dream with him. Leo said, join the Navy. Do not join the Marines. Not to be deterred, Leo lied, I mean, Mr. Ba Mr. Charles Bajeron lied about his age, 16 at the time, enlisted in the Marines in 1948. He was stationed in Japan at the time of the outbreak of hostilities as a member of the 1st Marine Division. His group was an important part of the daring Inchon invasion on September 15, 1950, led by Army General Douglas MacArthur. On September 24th, Corporal Charles Francis Bajeron was killed by enemy fire while going to get additional information, uh, ammunition for his fellow Marines as they liberated the capital city of Seoul. He was 18 years old, the first citizen of our parish to give his life in this cause. Corporal Bajeron trained as a Marine, fought as a Marine, and died as a Marine. He embodied the Marine Corps motto, Semper Fidelis, always faithful. He is remembered in our local military museum with his dress uniform and pictures on display in his, uh, his memory. He was just a kid. During the three-year conflict, 11 citizens of this parish were killed in action. The majority held the rank of private first class, and sadly, four were never recovered. I would be remiss if I did not mention the service of local historian and godfather of Regional Military Museum, C.J. Christ. He was a newly commissioned lieutenant in the Air Force in 1950 when he was ordered to Randolph Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas, to begin training on B-29 bombers. He was sent to Okinawa March 18, uh, 1951. He would fly 23 missions over hostile territory, narrowly escaping disaster on more than one occasion. He participated in the last daylight bombing raid of the war in October of 1951. It, is suddenly, it certainly it had become too dangerous. Moving on. Vietnam. The year was 1964. Lyndon Johnson was in the White House. The newly introduced Ford Mustang rocked the automotive world with its youthful design. The British invasion began with the Beatles' arrival in New York City and their performance on the Ed Sullivan Show. A naval incident in August off the coast of a nation called Vietnam in the Gulf of Tonkin would have dire consequences for our nation. Most Americans did not know where Vietnam was located. They soon would. The 10-year conflict would divide the American people as 58,220 servicemen and women gave their lives in defense of Vietnamese freedom. 24 citizens of our parish died in this conflict. Nine were members of the Marine Corps, 14 were soldiers of the Army, and one was a Navy sailor. Three of my classmates, the South Terrebonne class of 1965, died in this war. Marine Corporal Lewis Menard, Marine Lance Corporal Daniel Lewis, and Army PFC Kenneth Charles Boudreaux. Each of these men 
was 21 years old. Sergeant Albert Lee Rent, United States Army of Homa, served in Vietnam in the Mobile Riverine Force in the Mekong Delta as the communications chief of Company B, 3rd Battalion. He was a recipient, recipient of multiple commendations and four Purple Hearts for wounds received in combat. Albert is today the president of the United Veterans League of our city and of the Military Order of the Purple Heart. The final chapter of our story ends with on a tragic note. On January the 6th, 2006, a roadside bomb detonated near a Bradley fighting vehicle during a patrol outside of Baghdad. The explosion took the lives of six men on active duty in the Louisiana National Guard, 2nd Battalion, 156th Infantry Regiment, 256th Infantry Brigade, Combat Brigade, Charlie Company of Homa, the Black Sheep. The following included Sergeant First Class Kurt Como of Raceland, Sergeant Bradley Bajeron of Chauvin, Sergeant Huey Fassbender of Laplace, Sergeant Armand Luke Fricky of Homa, Sergeant Warren Murphy of Marrero, Sergeant Kenneth Von Ron, a medic for the New York National Guard. Their deaths are the largest single-day loss of life for Louisiana during this war. Two other members of the unit lost their lives in subsequent operations, Sergeant Paul Hetzel of Baton Rouge in March and Sergeant First Class Peter Hahn of Kenner in May of 2006. The late Kathleen Banco, our governor, said of their deaths, quote, dedicated Louisiana soldiers have made the ultimate sacrifice in Iraq, but never so many in one day. With us tonight is Lieutenant Colonel Jacques Thibodeau. Jacques was the 156th commander during the Charlie Company train-up to his deployment. He was ordered to a new assignment just prior to their deployment, but will remember forever their sacrifices. And here I quote Jacques. I'm often asked about my service in the local Louisiana National Guard units. I served in both Charlie Company, 2nd Battalion, 156th Infantry Regiment, Homa, and Delta Company of 2nd Battalion, 156th Infantry Regiment, Thibodeau, of the 256th Infantry Brigade Combat Team. I often reflect on my time in these units as they were the foundation of my military career and much of my life. There are very few teams like these two units. Our sense of family in this area is what defines our community. It is rare to go anywhere in Homa, Thibodeau and not find someone who has either served or has had a loved one who has served in these two units. It's important for me to convey the significance of these two units and their presence on the stage of freedom. The United States Department of Defense Meritorious Unit Award, MUC, is awarded to units of the United States Armed Forces for exceptionally meritorious conduct and performance of outstanding service for at least six continuous months during a period of military operation against an armed enemy on or after January 1, 1944. This unit must display such outstanding devotion and superior performance of, exception, of exceptionally difficult tasks as to set it apart and above other units with similar missions. Since 9-11, since both Charlie and Delta Company as units assigned to the 256th Infantry Brigade, Brigade, Brigade were awarded the Meritorious Unit Citation three times, 2005, 2010, 2021 three combat tours, and three MUCs for each company. It's safe to say these units and soldiers made a statement as to what freedom means and how do we defend it. Since 9-11, the Louisiana National Guard has lost 44 Louisiana citizen soldiers in defending our freedom. Of the 44, 37 were from the 256 Infantry Brigade Combat Team. 29 perished in 2006, 6 in 2010, and 2 in, 20, two in 2021. Nine from the Homa Thibodeau units in 2006. Our community paid the steepest price in all of Louisiana in the defense of freedom. I count myself lucky to have served with these fine men, nine warriors who are not afraid to stand up to evil. They represent all that is good in our country. They are truly heroes. Tonight, I have paused to honor the services of countless men and women from our parish who over two, for over 250 years have brought honor to themselves, this community, this state, and this nation in the defense of freedom. May their sacrifices never be forgotten. May their names always be spoken and may their memories never fade. We're going to close with a slideshow and hopefully some music.
God bless America. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Mr. Phillips, for that very informative and very moving presentation. And thank you for your service. And also thank you for your, uh, your passion in keeping those memories alive. Um, I think we're going to take a break. We're going to move on with the presentation. Uh, Council Chairman Gidry had a, another uh, function to attend to. And um, as a grandfather, I know that um, he's going to a, a dance recital for his granddaughter. And uh, my wife and I went to um, our granddaughter's recital, dance recital this past Sunday. So. Um, uh, he asked me to cover for him. Uh, I would like to share one personal um, story with you. Uh, my name is Mike Toops. I'm the parish manager, and I learned something tonight. I learned that my ancestors served in the uh, the Battle of New Orleans, so uh, I can thank Mr. Phillips for that. Um, one more story I, I'd like to share, and it's a story that my dad told me a long, long time ago. I was just a kid. Uh, we're our family is uh, Tussos from Lockport. But uh, my dad told me that um, when Mo World War II was going on, he decided to join. And um, he had two younger brothers, my Uncle Roland and my Uncle Henry. And he called them all together and he said, look, we, uh, we need to join. We need to serve our country. He said, but um, he said, I think we ought to join separate branches of the service uh, to make sure that our chances of getting killed are, are less. So he joined the Navy, my Uncle Henry, my Uncle Henry joined the Marine Corps, and my Uncle Roland joined the Army. And thankfully, all three of them came back alive. But you can imagine the goosebumps I felt when I saw the movie um, Saving Private Ryan. And uh, his words came back to me. Um, but we're going to move on with the program. And it's my honor to uh, present uh, Oma Police Department Chief Dana Coleman. Uh, Chief Coleman has done a phenomenal job running our Oma Police Department. And he's going to give a presentation on the history of the Oma Police Department. So it's my honor to present a good, good friend of mine and a co-worker, Chief Dana Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Toops, for that introduction. Um, we need to give Mr. Phillips another round of applause for that presentation. That hit home. First of all, good evening to those assembled. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to learn about the history of Terrebonne Parish <clears throat> and the many entities encompassed within our parish as we share in this bicentennial celebration. To introduce our presenters today, 
for the Homer Police Department is yours truly, who will discuss the locations of, that our agency occupied, Assistant Chief Dwayne Farmer, who is a descendant of one of our past police chiefs, who will discuss the beginning of the police chief position, and Captain Lonnie Lusco, who is another descendant of one of our former police officers, um, and he will discuss the evolution of communications and patrol within our agency. One of our presenters, Captain Bobby O'Brien, um, couldn't be with us here today, but he's uh, definitely in our spirit. I want to thank those who assisted us with our research, and those uh, entities can be located within your brochure. On that note, let's get started. We would like to first dedicate this presentation to a young man within our agency who lost his life during Hurricane Ida as a result of a traffic accident. That young man is no longer with our agency. Um, his name is Patrolman Officer Austin Spencer Bush, badge number 438, who was our agency's first line of, first line of duty death recorded in our history. And we want to de dedicate this presentation to him and may badge number 438, Austin Spencer Bush, forever rest in peace. As we all know, the transitions of law enforcement across the nation, as well as within HOMA, took place over a period of years. Initially, during the colonies, there were watch groups that were conducted night watch patrols. And in some areas, these patrols were assigned to capture runaway slaves. As we forego into the 1900s, the concept of police and their duties became more and more organized, which mirrors basically the beginning of the HOMA Police Department, which took place sometime around the 1900s. And as you can see in this slide, the uh, evolution of police starting in the colonies around the 1600s, the first official force established in Boston in 1838, and modern police forces began around the 1900s. And their mission was to prevent crime and keep order. And as you can see from the colonies all the way until modern day police officers to where we're more tactical. Reflecting on these tra transitions, how ironic would it be that a descendant of slaves, yours truly, would have an opportunity to one day become the first African-American police chief in the history of the Homa Police Department? To my colleagues assemble with the Homa Police Department as well as the Turbon Parish Consolidated Government, past and present, it's an honor and a privilege to take this journey through history with you all. As we look at our agency over the years, some locations that we operated out of, these buildings still exist today. Names displayed on the exteriors have changed, but for the most part, those historical buildings still exist to this day. As you can see here, in the early uh, developments of our police department, um, our current Lapeat Theater, our agency operated out of there, one of the, it's known as one of the first recorded police stations. But as we conducted our history, we learned about a building that some of you may be familiar with called the Ashe Building. And um, we learned that at some point during history, our department operated out of the Ashe Building as well. Moving right along, the picture you see here was, um, it's the, current location of the Homa Fire Department's headquarters, which is located on Roussel Street. And as you can see here, our department operated out of that building as well. These are the articles here when um, the department was assigned to that facility. And as history takes place, that building is still in existence and it's the current location of our fire department's headquarters. Moving right along. There was an old school on Good Street that our department operated of, but unfortunately that school um, was damaged in a fire. There's a nursery that's uh, in that location now, and how ironic is it that across the street from our agency that we have young individuals, young kids that in that nursery, they may make up a small percentage of our population, but these young individuals are definitely 100% of our future. So they operated out of this building. The picture to my left, your right, 
is a picture of an academy class that's depicted in front of that building. And as you can see here to the right at the uh, front is Chief Farmer's dad, um, Chief Charles Farmer, who was the head of that training academy. Moving right along. I know it's kind of hard to see on these uh, placards at the bottom, but in 1978, um, the plans to build our current uh, department at 500 Honduras Street was in place in 1980. It was uh, completed, and this is the opening ceremony. Um, there are several dignitaries depicted in this picture. Um, too many names to, to call here. Some are still here. Some are going on to glory. But our department is operating out of that current location now, which is 500 Honduras Street. As we progress further, working along with our uh, current parish government, this is a current picture of 500 Honduras Street. And out of that building, our department is growing tremendously. But out of 500 Honduras Street operates our administration, patrol, crime scene, and records. Our department is growing um, at an alarmous rate. At 4800 Highway 311, our investigations and school resource officers operate out of that facility. 879 Bayou Black Drive, which is our special operations and SWAT. 112 Capitol Boulevard, which is our narcotics, K-9, and procurement. And in the plans with parish government, there's a future building that will be erected on the east side of Homer, where we will then increase our patrol expansions. So at this point, I'm going to bring up Chief Dwayne Former, Assistant Chief Dwayne Former, who will discuss the legacy of the police chiefs within our agency, starting at the beginning. As, the, as Chief Coleman said, I'll, I'll be uh, just giving a brief history on the, the chiefs of police of the Homer Police Department. Prior to, the, prior to the beginning of the Homer Police Department, and I'm speaking in the, at the end of the uh, 1890s, there was a gentleman, uh, uh, Francis Xavier Zeringer Sr., who eventually became the first chief of police in Homer in 1912. Building in the middle, Father Arthur, Zer An I'm sorry, Andrew Zeringer, first threw his uh, hat in the ring in, in politics and, bec and became a uh, city councilman in 1886. And then Ch Chief Zeringer got, it, got into politics in 1896 uh, through records at the clerk of court's office wh where you go down and take your oath of office and sign the. Uh, paperwork, he began his uh, law enforcement career as an assistant marshal for uh, Terrebonne Parish, eventually uh, being elected as the marshal of Terrebonne Parish in 19, 1898, and then he continued as marshal, uh, never being beaten in, in any election until 1912 when he was elected the first chief of the city of Homer. On uh, June 10th, 1912, and he served till March 6, 1919, until he uh, uh, passed away in office. Uh, he was buried in the St. Francis Number One Cemetery, along with other uh, family members. At which point, uh, uh, Chief Peter Frank Kurtz. W was sworn in as the second chief of police, served from April, April 9th, 1919 to May 6, 1920. <coughs> and then third chief, Khalees Callahan, served from May 6, 1920 to June 31st, 1922, and was replaced, just, just to give a little brief history, in, in, the, in the beginning of a uh, the, the, the chiefs of police, they, they fell into the, every two years they, they, they'd have an election. Unlike today, we have, you know, every four years, it was every two years they'd be election for the politicians. So the, the, uh, the, the, the beginning of chiefs of police were actually elected. At, at this point, uh, we, we have appointed chiefs of police. 
around the 1950s, 60s. They started a point w at the time that uh, uh, the civil service system was implemented with the uh, Homo Police Department. But until then, every two years, they were elected in the office just like all the other uh, politicians. Uh, then the, the, the fourth chief was a Peter Bourgeois. He served uh, July 1st, 1922 to October 5th, 1923, at which point he resigned. And Chief Callahan, C.A. Callahan, came back as the chief of police. In uh, October of 1923, and he served till May of uh, 1936. And I'm going to back up a little just to give an idea of when the, when the police department started, th th there was, there was a, of course, a, there was a, always a sheriff of Terrebonne Parish. They had, uh, there were constables, police, juror, pl uh, police jurors, uh, justice of the peace, I should say. And uh, marshals, which which made up the contingency of law enforcement in Terrebonne Parish. Look, looking through the uh, oath book, it was learned that the uh, like when the police department first started, they didn't have a building, not documented anyway. And it was it was the chief would have he, he may he may have been look overseer of sanitation, uh, burying animals. It's, it start, started where well, you start seeing these special officers assigned on an ad needed basis. There, there, there wasn't a police force. You had, you had the, the, the leaders of each of these uh, earlier stated marshal's office, sheriff, constables, and a, as needed, they, they, they would, uh, they would uh, s send special officers down to, to, to be sworn in. I, I, I saw in one, one case there was a there was special officers for uh, the American Legion uh, property on Williams, special officers to, to work the the uh, home air base, special officers to, to uh, assigned to that downtown area. So so as, as through the years the police department started building to to where they in, ended up with a police force, but prior to that. It was. It appeared that it was an as needed, ad, as need basis that, that they would, uh, I guess we would know like as deputize a police officer. When Francis uh, Zeringer was first sworn in as the uh, first police chief, the population of Homa in nineteen in the nineteen ten census was five thousand twenty four. And I'll speed ahead to where. Uh, Khalees A. Callahan was sworn in in 1923. The population, the 1930 census, had 6,534 people in Homa. The, ne the next chief of police was Christopher Pierre Mathern, May of 1936 till February of 1948. I would, he would, he's the longest uh, term uh, chief that w we located. And do it, during his term, the population had, had grown to 9,052. Sh shortly thereafter, we, we see our first superintendent of police in Homa, an Arnie Cherrier, February of 1948 till January of 1953. And the population in 1950 had grown to 11,500. 11, so through the years, the police department they starting to they starting to you can see in the the uh, the old books where they're they're hiring actual police officers along the way as the population is growing, and you saw less and less special police officers and and you and you saw sworn in as police officer of the city of Homa police department, and following we had we had a another superintendent of police January nineteen fifty three to nineteen fifty seven. And I'm not sure the story of wh why it changed from uh, chief to superintendent, but it did. And as as we we were doing our research, w I mean, we we knew it, but it really hit home to us that there's not a lot of history for for the Homer Police Department, and we're we're going to continue to 
do research and build our website so, so future officers, when they come in, they'll have a better understanding and the citizens of Homa can see a better, have a better understanding of the, the history of the police department, but it's, it wasn't a re real documented uh, uh, department with, with the city, but we're going we're gonna to continue to work on it. And I, I actually, I, uh, probably many of us in here, I, I enjoy genealogy, so I really had a good time flipping one page at a time, looking at, at the old books. Uh, uh, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of the people I'd, I remember from my dad's through the years, he, my dad, uh, who I'll get to late, later, he, 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 he was sworn in in 1962, and uh, he, he came to Homer with the, with the, in the Air Force, as, as they were speaking later, married my mom and stayed and uh, continued his career with the police department. Uh, next, next we had a, another superintendent, George Leslie Broussard, Jan June 1953, 1957, followed by Superintendent William Bill Fake, May 1957 to 62. Here, th there was some political something going on that another, and I, 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 my dad told me a little bit about some political issue going on there that want, want to continue to, to research the, but it's 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 not well documented. Where he he serves for a while, and and then we're, we're back to chief of police, MF Jimmy Malonson, and at some point, uh, Superintendent Fake leave, leaves the, the the department, and then comes back. In 1964 through 1967, until he resigns, and then th th this is where uh, Chief James Victor Frank, wh where I was a kid when my dad first started, and in, in, uh, in the, the following people were, were people that I actually uh, knew. My, when, and it, Chief Chief Frank was from 1967 to 1975. By 1970, the population had reached 30,000, a little over 30,000 in Homa. There, there was, and that, that's when they were at the, what you saw earlier, the, the Roussel building, Roussel Street building, and it, it, where, they, where they were starting to build, a, it, to getting into the 20s with uh, police officers. Present day, Chief, I guess we we're about nine, we we're around 90-ish, 90 90-something police officers. And the population, I, I think, last I saw was thirty-three thousand and nine hundred, whatever. And then, following Chief Frank was uh, Chief Laura Rose, nineteen seventy-five to seventy-nine. And then, in nineteen seventy-nine through eighty-seven, as the chief spoke, where he was showing the where, where, where they moved into the new uh, building where we're presently at on Honduras Street. My, my dad was the chief, Charles Kirkland Farmer, from 1979 to 1987. Chief Jack Smith served between 1988 and 1998. Chief Orville Callahan was served from 1998 to 2001. Chief Ch Patrick Allen Boudreau served from 2001 to 2008. Patrick and I went to the police academy together. Next was Chief Todd DePlanis, served from 2008 to 2015. And finally, from 2015 to present, we, we have Dana Tymone Coleman as the uh, chief with the police department. And I'm I, I, I'm just going to go back to the to the beginning with the Zeringer family and speak a, just briefly on that, and I'll close. The, the Zeringers had been a name in politics for over a hundred, uh, right near a hundred years in uh, Terrebonne Parish. His father first, Andrew Zeringer, like like I said, threw his hat into the uh, councilman ring. He was a councilman in 1886. Then uh, FX FX Zeringer. Was known as FX in uh, in Homer. 
was a, like a, he, he he had his career. His son was a was a was in Paris politics. He was a recorder with the clerk of court's office. It, his son worked worked in city city hall. He was a secretary of Homa uh, for four mayors. Continuing to one one more son that uh, was an, uh, an attorney, and Mrs. Z the, Mrs. Zeringer married into a, a, a political family as well. So so for hundred years that was a strong name in Terrebonne Parish, and eventually became our first chief of police. So uh, thank you for att your attention. Evening, everybody. Captain Lonnie Lusco, and I just want to tell you something real quick because when my slide comes up, I want you to understand what I'm what I'm explaining. Um, I've been on the department 30 years with the Homa Police Department. I am a third generation law enforcement, and the reason I'm bringing it up because that's my father up there as the second generation. My my grandfather was a uh, with the state police. What's real interesting about what we're talking about today is what happened 50 years ago or whatever compared to now, and I just want to explain something to you. So Assistant Chief Former mentioned about the numbers of police officers that were working back then. I remember Dad telling me back in the 50s, there were not more than about 8 to 12. It was a very small department, and we're, like you just said, near 100 right now. Dad, if you see right here, as he's working an investigation as a captain, he had made captain in 12 years. It's not to bra brag about him, but it tells you about something, how quick rank moved in that department. But the work of what the captains did back in them days, like what he's doing here, the captains investigated the serious crimes. You didn't have uh, detective bureaus, juvenile detectives, and all like it's broken down today. So it's so, I appreciate it so much to look back at what happened back then, and you look at where we are today and what we're able to provide uh, for our community, and it makes me very proud. You know, when they patrolled back in the days, they, they did foot patrol. They had a couple of cars. They, um, very, uh, it was very, it, you didn't see police officers probably as much like you would see today. Of course, the town was a lot smaller. One example was the communication system. They explained that we were going to talk about that. When you got a call back in them days, I mean, uh, uh, maybe nobody here remembers this, but they would flash the street lights, and they told that police officer, you need to go over that call box, and he'd get on the call box, call dispatch, and find out what the call was. Today, our communications take us all across the state of Louisiana. I can be in Shreveport and be able to commu communicate back here in Homa. I can switch my channels. I can communicate with the Terrebonne Parish Sheriff's Office and other state police and other agencies, and that just shows you where we have advanced from then until now. Uh, today, it's not unusual for the law enforcement community to be using drones. Helicopters. We have a um, sheriff's office, and which I'm not going to speak for, but even the police department, we have boat, boat uh, patrol divisions. Serious incident, it's not unusual to see a command post pull up where we have command and control on scene. Interesting thing about that bottom picture, there was a series of burglaries going on in town, and the suspect was arrested. Um, was responsible for, for many of the safe burglaries, actually served time. The money in this particular photo was never found. Later, that guy got out and bought a baseball team. At least that's the story Dad told me. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how that worked out. You know, it's an interesting thing right here. In fact, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll throw this, this bet at you right now. That, it's hard to see, but this picture is one of the first radar units that was uh, purchased for the Homer Police Department. Do you remember the pneumatic rubber hoses that went across the highway? They used them to be able to determine speed. When the tire hit the first hose, by the time it hits the second, it gives you a calculation of speed. They also used them for traffic counts, too. Well, if you or anyone in here can remember the name of that device, there was actually a particular name, started with an A, the last symbol of that name was a meter, so it's some type of meter. But I do have a gift for anyone that can remember the name of that, uh, that, that device. Today, using the, uh, the Doppler effect, just like if you throw a rock in a pond, a steel pond, you'll get a ripple effect. 
when that ripple effect hap happens to hit another object, which in this case would be a vehicle, you'd get a ripple effect coming back to the source, which is the radar, and the distance between them two objects would, uh, would respond to the, uh, the speed of the vehicle. In today's radars, we can run multiple vehicles at one time and get speeds for all these different vehicles, and we are, are able to explain that in court. This, this article, well, the reason we got this one on here is we wanted to be able to explain 50 years ago, think what was happening back when we talked about media. The stories, you think about it, were a lot more positive than what we have in today's time. Media was handled a lot differently. Today, we deal with free speech, which is a wonderful thing that we, we, uh, we promote every day. But such um, outlets like MySpace, Twitter, GroupMe, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, doesn't do wonders for the law enforcement community when people make judgments and, and don't have all the facts. But that's okay because in a professional department, like what you have here between the sheriff's office and the police department, we make sure we provide you with quality service and we are very transparent. Both departments, we have no problem with our transparency and we, uh, we ensure that everything is out front. Going through the technology of what, thinking back when my dad and uh, Assistant Chief Former's dad were police officers, none of this was available to them. For example, the in-core cameras. We have cameras that give you a surrounding view of the outside of the unit while also being able to monitor the person who is handcuffed in the back so that when he has any types of false claims or he indicates that something happened, we're able to go back on our recording through data that's saved and be able to prove or disprove that. Also, the body cam. That has proved to be one of our uh, most useful tools right here in the center. Uh, we collect all our data from our body cams daily. If a complaint was to come into the office, we have our, our body cam data. We'll pull it up, and it's, an, it's transparent. We're open. We'll look into every complaint that's brought to our department. Uh, surveillance. Many, many surveillance cameras within Terrebonne Parish and the, home, uh, the, the city limits. Many crimes are solved using these surveillance uh, cameras. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful piece of equipment. Our GPS mapping, we're able to locate our vehicles at the time of need if there's a particular type of crime and we can send the unit that's closest to that area. We talked about our radars. Today's radar, we don't even have to be located at the site anymore because this radar is able to record the traffic that's coming through and the speed. We also have our license plate recognition cameras. When a stolen vehicle is reported, the license plate information is pumped in through the state. When this system here, which also works in, in, a, in a, um, a stationary um, type of uh, unit, will get a hit of a stolen vehicle and immediately send the information to our dispatch. Our dispatch is able to call a unit that's in the area using the GPS system, and we'll have a unit respond to that area attempt to locate that vehicle. And, and last, just talking about the growing issues that we face, when I look back at the days of where my dad and uh, a, a Chief Former, uh, mental illness was looked at a lot different back then than the way that we look at that today. Today, we've, we're more educated. We know that mental illness is not always a crime. Uh, that we, we take our time, we make sure we evaluate our, our person to, to differentiate whether a, a crime was actually a crime with intent or is there another reason such as what a mental illness issue may cause. Homelessness. Homelessness is still an increased problem in our area. We're working well with parish government. We have volunteer groups that, uh, that help us with um, providing food and shelter, making sure that these people are taken care of. And the last topic I'll close with is the addiction and overdoses. 30 years I've been in this department. I could probably put the numbers together of my first 20 and tell you this, uh, even 25, and tell you that the last five would probably outnumber the 25 of the overdoses and the deaths caused by drugs due to certain drugs being out there. Fentanyl being one of the worst that's hitting us very big. Fentanyl being 50 to 100 times stronger than morphine. 
and these drugs are on our street, and we're working hand in hand with our sheriff's office, our local, I mean, our uh, state police. Um, we're trying to educate our kids in the school, working together and connecting with our community to overcome these problems. But it sure does. It's so interesting to hear the stories of my dad back in his days and the way they policed to see what we're doing now. I really wish he was still around to see this technology because it's amazing. Thank you all very much. So in closing, thank you for your attention. As you can see between our administration, um, to my far right, which is your left, Captain Bobby O'Brien, uh, Assistant Chief Farmer, yours truly, and also Captain Lonnie Lusco. We have over 100 years of experience within HPD. Yours truly um, was appointed as the uh, first African-American police chief. Um, Assistant Chief Dwayne Farmer, a descendant of a past chief, Captain Bobby O'Brien, who is connected with the Homa Nation, who performed at the beginning of this program, and also Uniform Car Patrol Commander Captain Lonnie Lusco, who is also, like he said, a third generation descendant of our department. So thank you for your attention. God bless you and God bless America. Uh, this is our third presentation. Uh, if you see the logo to Terrebonne 200, uh, President Dove started this committee, thank you, sir, to uh, develop these presentations, I guess about a year and a half, two years ago. And I would like to thank the, uh, the people that's on the committee. They put in a lot of hard work. Uh, our first presentation was about business uh, history. Our second presentation was on transportation. This was our third presentation. Our next presentation, which is July 7th, right, Ms. Debbie? And it's going to be here, and it's going to be on um, the environment. Um, I would like to thank all the, the people like, that spoke today. I would like them to come back up. Mr. Phillips, if you're still here, uh, Sh Sheriff Sonier, uh, Chief Coleman, uh, I'd like to thank Dean Schwess and his group at the Civic Center for putting this on, our very talented IT department, and uh, two ladies that don't get enough recognition, Ms. Debbie Artigo and Ms. Lilani Adams from our administration. <laughs> thank you all for attending. Uh, one more thing. Uh, in October, we will be having a parade and a festival at the Courthouse Square. We're still developing all of the details, but we will keep you informed as we get more information. So at this time, again, I'd like to thank all these guys for uh, giving up their time, all of the research, and we'll open up the floor for any questions.